Okay, I'm gonna start now. I'm sorry if I'm um, my voice is a bit funny and I'm I'll be coughing and my ass is swollen because I just recovered from COVID. But I'm negative, don't worry. So I'm not going to infect you. But <clears throat> I put as much uh, as possible on my PowerPoint presentation. So just in case I can talk in the middle, you can just read the PowerPoint. So but I want to save my voice a bit <laughs> so I can answer questions. And today there's no chair as well. I'm, I'm not sure why. I think, I don't know. It's perhaps related to COVID or what, I don't, I'm not really sure. So I'm just going to keep going, you know, whether, uh, whether there's any chair or not, I'll just keep going. Okay, and um, please ask me as many questions as possible because this is a work in progress, which means that I just started this work. Uh, it's just the beginning. <laughs> Yeah, I, I really just started, so I still don't really know where I'm going uh, to go with this. Uh... <laughs> okay, research. Let's wait for about one or two minutes, probably, because there's the people coming. I'll uh, wait for about one or two minutes, because I know some classes uh, finish at 5 p.m. One or two minutes of the last time. Okay, let me start now by explaining what I mean by Indonesian political exiles here. Yeah, they are the people who identify themselves as such because uh, the term political exiles, Indonesian political exiles, can be quite complicated, which I'm, I'm going to explain later. And um, just an overview this is about Indonesians working or studying overseas whose citizenship was annulled by the embassies in the wake of the imprisonment and mass murder of millions of communists and alleged communists in Indonesia, known as the 1965 genocide. Now, this is just the background a bit. Um, I'm gonna start with Sukarno and the non-aligned movement. Okay, uh, anyone know who Sukarno is here? Yeah? Uh, Oh, and, and anyone doesn't know who Sukarno is? You don't know? Okay, I'm going to explain a bit. So, so Sukarno, Sukarno is the first president of Indonesia. He is known to be left-wing and pro-communist. But actually, in the midst of Cold War, the first president of Indonesia, Sukarno at that time, refused to align Indonesia with either side. So he refused to align with either left or right. And he also hosted the first Afro-African conference in 1955 in Bandung, West Java. And at the conference known as the Asian African Conference, 21, 29 nations present, they agreed to be abstained from aligning with either the Western or Eastern blocs. However, this neutrality did not satisfy many policymakers in the United States. So, so, what the policymakers in the United States once said to Sukarno was either you are on my side or not, basically. They were implying something like that and they started spying on you. Eventually, because of that, Sukarno was getting closer to the Eastern Bloc and the Indonesian Communist Party. Indonesia also had transnational exchanges with several countries, including the communist countries. These exchanges allowed Indonesian students and journalists to travel abroad, such as to China and the USSR, Albania and other communist countries. The exact numbers of Indonesians who were sent to the Eastern Bloc is not clear, but I'll just give you a small overview. By 1965, the total number of Indonesians sent to the Soviet Union during Sukarno's government is around 2,000, the largest foreign student population in the Soviet Union. And then what happened is the genocide of communist left-wing people and alleged communists. On the 1st of October, dawn, six top generals of Indonesian army and 180 are murdered. On the 5th of October, burials of the generals, Suharto, who was a general at that time and who later became the, the, the second president of Indonesia, 
blames the PKI, the Indonesian Communist Party, for what happened. Propaganda against the PKI and the left wing women's organization spreads. And soon after the mass murder of communist left wing people and people associated with the PKI in Now, from 1955 <laughs> till 1967, approximately one to two million people were murdered by Suato's army in the name of suppression of the Communist Party. The number is not here even now. So that was really, in a way, it's a sad thing that you know millions of people were murdered, but no one bothers finding out how many were actually murdered. Well, millions of others were imprisoned, tortured, and or raped. Soon after, Suharto was anointed as acting president and elected as president in 1968. His regime is known as the New Order. And when um, the Suharto regime started, uh, Indonesia opened up investment uh, to Western countries. So uh, companies like Freeport, Exxon <laughs> actually invest in Indonesia. And <clears throat> during the Sukarno, when these uh, Western companies, these giant companies wanted to invest in, the, uh, in Indonesia, <clears throat> they at that time, one of the um, one of the regions that, that they were, their favorite region is West Papua. You know why? Anyone knows why? Biggest gold mine in the world. So in Papua, in West Papua, there's the biggest gold mine in the world. And at that time, when these foreign companies, these Western companies wanted to um, invest in West Papua, Sukarno said, okay, fine, but you will get 30% and I will get 70%. And, and at that time, he was sending lots and lots of students to go overseas because his plan is once they come back to Indonesia, then they will take over these foreign companies. That was his plan. Not to be, of course because then um, Sukarno was toppled and then the foreign investment came. And can you guess uh, during the Suharto, uh, during the agreement with the Suharto, then what is the um, <coughs> division? So during Sukarno, it was 30% for the Western companies for Axon and things like 30%, 70% for Indonesia. During Suharto, can you guess how many percent? Percentage. Anyone? Can you say anything? Nine, over 90% for over 90%. Yeah. And the rest, like around five or ten percent, also have those problems. The people in the West Papua had to get it. So that's why this wasn't quite surprising in a way that recently declassified documents reveal the active involvement of the British, American, and several other Western governments in the mass murder to get rid of the left-leaning Sukarno with the more obedient Sukarno. The Indonesians overseas now during that period, most students overseas during the so-called 1965 coup were perplexed by what happened in Indonesia because news about the country was rather conflicting. While curious, many students in Soviet Union could not get much information about Indonesia because the only radio channels were from the Russian government, not from other countries. The radio there only reported there was power struggle and the murder of generals without mentioning the PKI. So that's it. And um, what they told me was some students actually tried to get the um, radio channel somewhere else. So they what they did was they were actually climbing. They, they were making all kinds of They're climbing like really tall building, you know, and right at the top, so they could, they brought the radio so, so they could find, get a channel there from somewhere else. It's really risky what they did because if they got caught, not sure what, what happened to them. And also climbing that high at night was not fun. Yeah. But they really wanted to know what happened in Indonesia. Not long after, they heard that on 11 March 1966, Suharto had given authority to Suharto to take whatever measures Suharto deemed necessary. Some of these Indonesians suspected
suspected that this was part of the coup plans against Sukarno. Then the embassy distributed statements to be signed by Indonesians overseas. It was a few months later, actually. So it was around mid 66 until late 66. Different embassies had different forms, but the main idea was similar. The requirement to condemn the PKR as the culprit of the chaos and the instability in Indonesia and to support Suharto's new government. Those who refused to sign had their passports confiscated. And of course, there was no acknowledgement, even now, despite the promise of the recent President Jokowi, they would resolve past human rights cases. He still has not admitted that the genocide took place. The former history still largely maintains the new order version, that is the Indonesian Communist Party murdered the generals and tried to carry out a coup, therefore the mass murder of communists and alleged communists could be justified. So, truth and reconciliation. Many activists, including the filmmaker Joshua Oppenheimer, have emphasized that there must be proof and reconciliation. Activists in Indonesia also established the movement the year of the slogan, truth is the future. However, as I was gathering data and testimonies for my respondents, I encountered many problems, especially when I related <laughs> his testimonies to the intention of finding. Several accounts of the victims, survivors, and political exiles have now been published. However, there have been countless efforts to undermine these testimonies. The recent example is that of the Indonesian Minister of Maritime and Investment Affairs, Lut Panjai, that he has called them traitors. And of course, he tried to emphasize the um, inconsistencies amongst the accounts. And then he said, oh, they're just interpretations. No, no, you know, they, they, they don't tell the truth. That's what he said. Of course, the truth is you should expect it to be consistent, objective, precise, more significant. Just like the saying the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Because this is what the um, uh, activists, in a way, aim at, right? taking those responsible to court. So as we already held like the International People's Tribunal 65 as well in 2015 <clears throat> in, the, um, in The Hague. And it, it is important, they say, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing else. There's a problem, however. Yeah. The conservative, the conservative view of the truth is that if proportions correspond to reality, then it's, it is true. If it does not, then it is false. Now, in relation to this objective notion of the truth, when we talk about identity, then it is said to correspond with the so-called a true or real identity, not a fake or manipulative one. One of the problems of this is what often emerged when I was interviewing my respondents was not, was not the objective truth, but more of a negotiation. So when they tell me a story, they would say, please write such and such and such. They say the truth, it's not, is it? Well. Will I do that? as a researcher? I could not breach confidentiality. Yeah. So in the end, what I write is a matter of negotiation. This is a problem. Okay. And even the term political exile itself is already quite problematical. First, when I ask about the respondents about their definitions of a political exile. The responses were quite subjective. <clears throat> okay. Considering that all of these people who identify themselves as Indonesian political exiles are now allowed to return to Indonesia, the term Indonesian exile can be viewed as paradoxical. On the one hand, the word exile emphasizes the notion of rejection and detachment from the country. However, as formally there has been an option for them to return to Indonesia and become Indonesian citizens again, the other that this ex exiles and thus be challenged in this regard. Although, you know, it's not easy, <laughs> but there is a, an opportunity now. It's, it's not easy. Discussing the notion of belonging and national identities 
Hamid Saidian suggests the term diaspora for those who can move freely between nations because there's now no sanction for these Indonesian exiles upon, upon entering Indonesia. The definition of exiles actually no longer suits them. But that's how they identify themselves. So I, don't, I interviewed 15 people who identified themselves as political exiles between the end of 2017 until June 2022. But actually the, the most intense one was June 2022 because in um, 19, 2017, I was not, I was just like talking with another that interviewing intensely. And um, all of these exiles, of course, now can return to Indonesia. Again, it's not easy, but they can they want to. So in a way, the, the word exiles can be challenged. But as I said, I use this definition because they identify themselves as exiles. Now, another problem of the time. When I met these exiles, several of them were quite hesitant in telling me their stories. Most of them wanted to find out who I was and what I would write about them. So trust is a big issue here. Many also wanted to know at the beginning of the interview whether I can keep a secret and keep certain things confidential. So right from the beginning, the representation of these exiles at the debate was an important issue. So they would try to find out who I was. And they did admit that to me. Uh, they would not um, reveal their real identity to, to just anyone. They have to trust the person. And they say, uh, not all of them are like that, but some of them actually, most of them actually, most of them say, well, if I'm suspicious to the person, I'm not going to tell them that I'm, I, I'm a like son. They say like that. Um, I'm just going to tell them that oh, I've been here for years, I studied here, and that's it. So that's, that's what they say. So several of these exiles use different identities for different audiences. Now, two exiles in Germany now. This is the beginning, yeah. There were two exiles in Germany who were not only willing, but also excited to be interviewed. I traveled from London to meet them and these interviews were followed by, uh, with phone calls. They talked on the phone for a long time. One of them actually was on the phone with me three times, three or four, even more than that, actually lots. Almost every week he called me off. So it was like a long time. And when we talk, it could be nonstop. He would talk for two or three hours, talking about himself. So he was definitely so excited to talk. However, after I wrote about him and we negotiated what I had to write, he was still not happy because he thought it was not exactly like what he wanted. He wanted me to write quite a lot about the involvement of the US government in the 1960s. Genocide in Indonesia. I'm sorry, it's the, what's wrong with the um, spacing here? Now, another political, uh, yeah, so he, he wanted me to write, okay, you have to include this on my biography. But I said, look, mm, I'm going to put this on the introduction and I cannot repeat it on your, on your biography and then he said no 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 and in that case then don't, don't worry about it then no i don't want you to write about it suddenly just said like that that's it yeah so is it time wasted or no for me there's no time wasted for me the process is in a way is for me to learn what they are like and to discover that finding the truth is in a way the whole truth the truth and the whole truth is you know impossible in this case because as you see, this is a matter of negotiation. When I write, when I um, talk to them, when I actually in the end have their story written, it's, everything is a matter of negotiation and it can be a very long negotiation. Another political exile decided to go because according to him, my writing was too political. So I got really confused. No, 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 no this is too political. He said, uh, uh, so you are political exile, yes. I was made into political exile, but I was not actually political. And I think your writing is too political because I explain what it is about, what I'm discussing. And another one, no, no. 
and already met him, you know, traveled from London to meet him in Germany. And he just said no, you know, after a long time. So, so that's why it takes ages in the end to get their stories. Now, this is another case, a female political exile whose life story had been written by an author, but she told me she was not happy with what was written. I'm not going to mention her name and then the author's name as well, but she said, um, yeah, someone wrote it down. And then I wasn't happy. I told, I told the, the author I wasn't happy, but some of the author was not listening to me. Uh, and I get really upset with this author. Yeah, he said like that. She said like that. And then she said that when she took, uh, yeah, so therefore she was not sure whether she wanted to meet me. So we just talked on the phone. At the beginning, she said, I don't know because this happened to me. And then, you know, now I don't know whether I want to meet you again to, to meet someone else again, like a researcher or whatever. <clears throat> but then out of suddenly, she said, yes, I want to meet you. Suddenly, she said like that. So she agreed to meet me under the condition that I did not write about her and we just had a chat. Fine. So, so we met and we have launched her in August 2020 in Germany. I'm not going to mention the CD as well. Otherwise, you know, uh, I just want to protect the, her identity. Afterwards, when I was back to London, we kept in touch via WhatsApp. And in June 2022, when I went back to Germany, we met again. This time she said I could write about her late husband, who was also a political exile, rather than about her. About her husband. Fine, I said. Yeah. So I stayed with her for three days, had long interviews with her about her husband. The interviews were quite full of a warning of what or, or what or what not to write. So she would say, I will tell you this, but please don't write. I got quite confused sometimes because it got mixed up in the end. <laughs> you know? So I was like, so which one to write and which one not to write? I got really confused. Um, and she told me a lot about herself too. And the conversation about this could be non-stop as well. So uh, lots of them actually were desperate to talk about themselves. But, uh, but when I wanted to write about them, then that's when they started getting quite nervous. Sometimes when she talk about herself, she would say, oh, uh, why do I talk about myself? Isn't, isn't this supposed to be about my, my, my husband? Because <laughs> that's what she asked me to do. So after I finished writing about her and her husband, because I couldn't avoid it, you know, I couldn't avoid it not to write about her because it's her story about her husband. And I sent the writing to her. About five days later, she called me and said there were things which she was worried that they could be misinterpreted by other people. And she also said, oh, don't think this is embarrassing. Or did, did, did. There was just a lot of things. And in the end, I, I, don't, I, I got really confused. And then in the end, we just, um, yeah, we just agreed to just leave it. We just said, okay, let's just leave it for now. And then I just said, okay, let's, let's say that. So that's what happened. Yeah, nothing again. Now, four political exiles were willing to open up this time. And they said, fine, you can even write our real names. And that's why I write down the names here. And they all live in Germany. Why I picked Germany, uh, it's a long story, but there was a, because there was, I was also, um, somehow comparing between uh, the Holocaust and the 65 journals. <laughs> so that's why I thought Germany would be, in a way, a, a good choice in this case for me. Kind of like not, not a good choice, a, perhaps like appropriate. So two in Berlin, one in Münster, and one. All of them hold German passports now. All of them studied in the USSR when the 1960 journal. There was a took place. And four of them lost their passport for not being willing to sign with Suharto. So when I met them, as I expected, they talked about 1965 genocide quite a lot. However, another thing I noticed is how they related their identity to being a communist or not. Arif stated that although he did not join the Communist Party, he was pro communist. Arif was born in 1950. 40, 
five in Sleman, Sleman, Central Java. His father was leftist and politically active. He told me that he was inspired by the ideas of Charlie Ma. Whereas the other three, the other three exiles, let's get back to this one. So Warun Omahdi and Supacho, both of them, when they met me, they said, I'm not straight away. Yeah. They said, I'm not. And Willie also said like that. He said um, he was not actually political and he was not communist. So it was clear right from the beginning, it's whether they were communist or not, something, or whether they're like this or not, or you, you know, so that it, it's really, really clear. They want to make that clear somehow. So as I said, uh, Subhajo Warno and William are quite different from Arif, yeah. And um, Willie described himself as uh, apolitical when he was young, only later, after the Indonesian embassy refused to renew his passport and he had to get help from several parties and organizations in Germany, he became more interested in left wing ideas. So it's quite ironical in this case. Yeah. Their stories now concerning the 65. The four of them agreed. The army were the culprits along with Suharto and the US government. However, the narratives about communist people are quite different. Today, I will mainly compare and contest uh, two people, Suparjo and Eric Parsana, because I don't have enough time. Yes, only two. Suparjo. Born in 1945 in Solo, he specified that it was born in the same area as the current president Jokowi. When he went to study in the Navy Academy, he received a scholarship to study in the USSR in 1960. He said in 1963, the first Indonesian um, had the ambition that Indonesia should make their own atomic bombs to scare off Malaysia. And he was sent to, his, he was sent off to the USSR to work in the field of atomic weapons. But he said actually Indonesia has no basic knowledge to make atomic bombs. We studied in the USSR, but people there did not teach us much. Making atomic bombs was kept a secret from us. So we only learned some basic things, not much. Sugana also said he wanted to send people to outer space, but that was just part of his propaganda rubbish. The Indonesian Navy also founded an Institute of Rocket Science, but there was no way we could make our own rockets. We only gathered used rockets from Russia, which were cut into bits and pieces. Then we tried to put everything back to see will this work. Okay. So anyway, he was making fun of Sukarno quite a bit actually when he talked about Sukarno. When, we, when he heard about the so-called coup um, in 1965, Spajer was confused as to what really happened. In 1966, he and the other Navy students were required to sign a statement at the Navy organization of the USSR. And because Subhajo chose Sukarno, his passport was confiscated. Now, Subhajo tried to get refugee status from the USSR, however, his request was rejected because, according to him, he was slammed by the leader of communist Indonesian students. Um, Subhajo decided to move to Germany because he heard that there was a station in West Berlin called Cho where people could enter West Germany without being checked. So actually, he started by becoming a beggar, homeless, no money. He slept with other homeless people at the station. So you could you believe it? I mean, these, these people were in the way, you know. Um, I think there are quite a, a lot of Indonesians here. And you know, at that time, when people were sent overseas to study, it was really prestigious. They were like support selected people. Yeah. But because of this, then they became homeless at some point. They were just doing master's degree or they were doing postgraduate degree overseas. And then they had nothing, no money, no home. So that's what happened. Luckily, another Indonesian spotted him and asked whether he was Indonesian and why he was there. And this Indonesian is called, I can't remember now, Johannes something. Uh, Subhajo said, oh, this, this Indonesian was a Chinese Indonesian who helped Subhajo so that he could find accommodation, get refugee visa, and eventually get a job. Subhajo got quite lucky in this case. And um, besides having 
some are negative opinions about Sukarno. He also has negative opinions about communism. So he said, while 65 genocide was not the fault of the Indonesian communists, he thought the, PK, the PKI chairman, I did make many mistakes. For instance, he said, I did was arrogant and be a bad About the PKI, he said the PKI liked to pick stupid people so they could be easily influenced and ordered around. Therefore, they were recruiting people like farmers and laborers. And he said, many leftists do not like to talk with me because of my opinion, because I said to them that strategies of communists and Muslim fundamentalists are similar. Now, Arik Harsana, completely different in a way when we talk about communism and Sukkot. His father was politically active, especially in left wing and socialist organizations, and was an admirer of Sukarno. So after finishing high school, I went to um, University in Yogyakarta, Gajah Mada. Then he was offered scholarship to study in the USSR. Hearing this news, Arif's father was really happy because he believed by going to the USSR, Arif could learn more about Marxism. However, Arif's mother was upset because this meant that she had to split from her son for at least five years. She was really upset about it. It turned out that she had to be separated from her son not only for five years, but 28 years. So Arif landed in Moscow on the 17th of September, 65. Only a few days after he landed, then he heard about the 30th of September movement. <clears throat> so Arif told me that afterwards, the student organization was split into three after that happened. The nationalists, the religious, and the communists the nationalist was pro Sukarno. The pro religious students finally accepted Suharto and pledged loyalty to the The communist group clearly defended Sukarno as well. Arif remained active politically by demonstrating against Suharto and condemned the mass murder of the communists and alleged communists in Indonesia. He and his friends concluded that Suharto was responsible for this mass murder. The activities were supported by many students from other countries, especially from Cuba. On 16 January 1967, Arif received a letter from the Indonesian embassy stating that his passport had been announced, just like that. The letter mentioned that the establishment of the Indonesian Student Union in the USSR is illegal. According to Arif, the Soviet Union did not care about the political turmoil in Indonesia, so they may make peace with Suharto instead. Not long after, several students who were in Sukarno's supporters group had arguments with communist group. Again, this is still Arif's story. You know? Because there are different strategies in dealing with the political turmoil in Indonesia. So some still wanted to stay in the USSR, some wanted to go to China, some wanted to go to the West, some did a U-turn and sided with Suharto. Arif continued his study and graduated. He really wanted to go back to Indonesia, but it was impossible. So he worked in the USSR. It's not engineering, but he felt that USSR didn't do much for Indonesia. He said they don't care. China actually cares more, and the Chinese government makes more efforts in defending the communists who have been completely suppressed in Indonesia. Arif describes the PKI very positively. In relation to the farmers and laborers, for instance, he insisted that the PKI wanted to educate them and to make them politically aware as well as active. He talked about land reform in Indonesia in which the government limited the size of land that people could own. Those who owned all that the required size had to distribute the land to poorer people, mainly farmers who had worked on the land without owning land. In 1977, Arif decided to leave the USSR because if I continued living in the Soviet Union, I would not have been able to return to Indonesia. 
So he asked the local government for a permit to leave and travel with an expired passport by train via, via Poland. Then he got up at Chu Station again because it, at Chu Station was, you know, it was like at that time was the only station where no paper was checked. So he could get through to West Germany. And because he knew another political exile in Berlin, I stayed with him while trying to get a refugee visa as well as a job. Later, he revealed another story. So at the beginning, Uncle Ari Farsana was his real name. Right? I told you these are the people who were willing to open up with their real names. And actually, it was. He started changing his name in the mid-1980s because he wanted to be politically active. Again, his real name was Sudi Harsana. Then he used the name Sudi Harsana separated. And then later, uh, he started contacting other political exiles in Dortmund. And later, he changed his name again to Ari Harsana. Okay, it was only later that he told me this. And I said, could, could I publish this? Yes, it's fine. Finally, yeah, he said like that. So, as you see, when I talk to these political exiles, I feel that there are always layers and layers and layers of identity that 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 were, you know, kind of like they were refilled bits by bits by bits. And then even now, I don't know how many layers are still no, are still there. And I still open up. And you know, I don't know. I don't know. However, so much you commented that. These political exiles who changed their names were silly. There was no need because the government was not interested in chasing them as long as they remained officers. So he said, what's the use? So there are already discrepancies between these two people who were not members of the Indonesian Communist Party. So Ari was not a member of the Indonesian Communist Party. Subhajo was not, but you see the story is quite different. Um, the ways in which the two describe the political exiles in Germany are very different as well. So I just stated that because he was helped by other Indonesians when he just arrived in Berlin, he was trying to help other political exiles too. However, the political exiles in Germany often have arguments with each other. He said, arguments after arguments, especially the communist ones. After they met communists, they forgot about me, he said, although I helped them. I know many pro Mao Zedong Indonesian friends here. They are the same as those in Moscow. In fact, they don't know politics, but they're hostile to me. I have a communist Indonesian to come to Berlin, but later he ignored me. Yeah, so uh, this, oh my goodness, sorry, this jump here. So he went to a Christmas party and I was left home alone. <laughs> so so he, he talked about him quite again. Now, Ali said that political exiles in Germany were united and they helped each other. Although they had arguments every now and then, they were not, they were not really serious, mainly regarding different strategies. Um, and Arif told me that generally, the generosity of the political exiles, there's an exile in Dortmund who often opened his house for students and anyone who wanted to stay. His wife cooked for everyone who came. She bought huge pots and pans so that she could, she could cook huge meals for everyone who came to the house. So it was that generous. And, Actually, I experienced their generosity as well. They were just incredible. Because they wanted, they were just some of them really wanted to, wanted to talk to Indonesian students, especially during the new order, because these Indonesian students have been brainwashed, have been brainwashed by the new order, by Suharto regime. So that's what they <coughs> desperate to tell them, you know, uh, about the, what happened in 1965. They, they were desperate to have discussion with them. So they just opened the house just like that. Sometimes give them meals three times a day. It was incredible actually. So the problem is the political exiles who the joint communist party or who were identified as communists are often secretive and do not want to be interviewed. They usually just talk to me, but they just said, no, don't mention my name, don't, don't even mention uh, my stories, because they were still really frightened, so I, I cannot even mention it here. Because I did meet, I did meet some of them, but I can't even mention anything about them. 
Kang. So, does this mean this is the comeback of the postmodernist theory of there is no truth? Um, I think, are you aware of postmodernist theory here? Postmodernism? Or anyone does know? Should I explain a bit? So, in general, postmodernists see the truth as subjective, just like there's no universal or objective criteria of beauty, because beauty is really relative, objective, um, not, not objective. There's no universal or objective criteria of the truth. That's postmodernism. Yeah. But of course, this has been widely criticized. So the Ordon had <coughs> criticized the postmodernist theories. He argues that all the complete objectivity is impossible. Researchers have to aim as close as possible to their ideal. Science works not because it produces unbiased accounts, but because its accounts are objective enough to be proved or disproved no matter what anyone wants to be true. Now, get back to the political exiles. Many things are still not clear, including the incidents that caused the, ex the exile, for instance, who was the mastermind of the murder on the 1st of October? We still don't know yet. Memories can be inaccurate and can be planted, manipulated, and or distorted. And if we are too concerned about finding the truth in speaking with the survivors, this also will not work. I cannot keep pushing them to be objective. Although I know they lie or they keep secret, to be considering. Yeah, so that's why it's impossible. But so far, the discussion has been mainly about scrutinizing the truth. Yeah, Postmodernists also scrutinize the truth and inquiring what it is. What I want to pay attention to is the non truth, especially when dealing with traumatized victims and with authoritarian regimes whose cronies are still powerful. Non-truth can have many forms, among others, this manipulation, deception. There's so many forms. So which one and why? That's what I'm more interested in. So when I'm, I'm talking with these political exiles in the end, I'm not going to search for the truth and nothing but the truth. No, I'm not going to do that. But I'm aware that I'm searching probably the non-truth but I'm going to separate them and I'm going to find out why. Why in the end I have to keep negotiating I don't, their identities with me? Why? And this is part of the reason. The very beginning of their identity as political exile is based on intimidation, terror, and manipulation of power they were supposed to trust. They started being an exile when their passports were announced. Personally, they did not change. Personally, they just, at that time, they thought they were being honest. They were still themselves. That's what they thought. However, by confiscating some papers, just papers, which was something so, when you see it, it's just bloody papers. <laughs> it's just something, it's a construction, it's some formality. It's, in a way, it's, it's not part of your essential identity in a way, just papers. The authoritarian regime was somehow able to make these Indonesians no longer who they were. You know, anything else doesn't matter whether you are fake or not, it doesn't matter. You have to have this paper. You want to change your identity, you want to do whatever you want, you want to change your name, you want to uh, pretend to be someone else, it doesn't matter. The main thing is the papers. So this, they so far were depended not on their honesty or truthfulness, but on the ability to work around the system and if necessary, to manipulate them. This is the beginning of political exiles. And as you know, this is the beginning of the refugee status too. So that's why now when the UK tried to ban illegal refugees for me, this is just bloody cruel. Yeah, because they become illegal as if because they're not honest, they become illegal as if because they don't have the right papers and then they, they are somehow criminals. But as you can see, this is just unbelievable what they've done. 
because like what happened to these political exiles, they become political exiles, they change their identities to become in a way political exiles, they identify as political exiles because of this big only. So in discussing refugees and their home governments, ethnic must Madsen says, it is characteristic of the refugees that in his relation with the government, fear has taken place of trust and hated the place of loyalty. Yeah. So how can they tell the truth if they don't no longer trust who they were supposed to trust? That's rather than trying to be concerned with the single truth, what I'm doing is just let them talk and compromise with what they want to write. But my question is why we cannot really get the whole truth from these political exiles, why? The version considered as the truth in relation to 65 genocide in Indonesia has been around for a long time without being challenged. So in Indonesia, the truth was <coughs> the version of Suharto. During 32 years, it was the truth version. And there have been hardly competing discourses for a long time. To open up these other discourses within the hegemony, new order discourse is still hard for these people, especially if they still feel stigmatized, intimidated, and or threatened. So for me, to open up discourses is more important than finding an objective truth. I let them talk because I said to them, this is your discourse. This is yours. This belongs to you. And that's why I let them talk for hours and hours and hours because I said, just talk, just speak. It is your chance to speak. So that's why when they talk to me for three hours, I let them just talk. It is their discourse, it is their chance to speak. And they should be heard, even if in the end they don't want to be published, they don't want to be written. It is their discourse. And it is different from all of them, although they are different from each other, they are also different from the discourse of the new order. And now we have at least an option of seeing other discourses. Because the truth had been manipulated for so many years. And the so-called the truth had been clearly manipulated. <laughs> and sometimes it was too intimidating for this exile to speak about the truth and nothing about the truth because the truth had been dominated by the new order regime for too long. Yeah, because if there was only a single truth and then you just say, okay, you can talk and it can be something else. It was just, it can be really destabilizing for these people sometimes. How? Yeah. Discussing survivors' testimonies, Anna Kubeli has argued survivors of atrocities become deeply uncomfortable signifiers for the post-atrocity societies within which they live, access to structures of normality that privilege for getting, getting over and getting on with things through the denial of the peril of death. Of course, they, these political exiles may not have experienced atrocity, but it's in a way similar to what they experienced. It was quite destabilizing for them. It is thus impossible for many of the, these political exiles to speak openly and thoroughly sometimes. This has opened up opportunities for the new order cronies to undermine their testimonies too. Because if you say, okay, we, we want to get the truth, it is then an opportunity for them to say, well, look, you know, they speak about things differently, you know. But yes, of course, these are different discourses. So when talking about an event that happened about 60 years ago, interpretation, subjectivity, and misinterpretation are unavoidable, especially when dealing with traumatic experience. In this case, the way the victims and survivors describe the United incidents can also be considered as non-truth, because many of them cannot know what the objective truth is. They may also forget many details surrounding um, if it's during the span of time or have been traumatized to remember everything clear. <clears throat> so when people tell story, they are unavoidable, <clears throat> unavoidably immersed in the world of symbols, and symbol cannot represent the whole event or events, but merely symbol partially only. Yeah, so as cultural beings, humans should be allowed to be subject. Or to be in that 
So the danger of insisting on searching for the truth is that we can even consult files into accomplices of the authoritarian regimes as well as of the governments who try to ban them because the fear that as well as inaccuracy of the exiles testimonies can give opportunities for others to claim that either the truth does not, does not exist or these people are not telling the truth. Criticize their stories because of the inaccuracies will further shut them up. While the new order version of history has been allowed to spread widely for decades. So I want, what I want to speak now is their version. It doesn't matter yeah, whether it's inaccurate or what, I want to hear about their versions. Instead of trying to find the truth, I compare and contrast these exile narratives as discrepancies between their respective accounts were influenced by negative and positive images. With these exiles a chance to speak and a room to narrate their experience, to express their feelings and what they think in, instead of insisting on the truth. We still have need to differentiate between interpretation and manipulation and recognize the different forms of the non-truth and find out why they narrate these so-called non-truths. That's all me. And um, yeah, ask me any question. <laughs> okay, don't ask me any question. Maybe I mean, it's interesting what you said. Thank you so much. Because initially, I came in on wanting to understand more about the history, but then like, you bring in the aspect of truth and non truth. And I think it's, um, it's a true perspective that I have now and quite mind blowing. But what I want to ask you is that as you are going through this um, study and research, how do you then consolidate all the changing narratives of the different perspectives of these people, you know, whether it's being be it, um, manipulation or be it, like intimidation or how do you that with your own thoughts of what you had previously of this of, of the of the history? Because obviously, but um, when you started this um research, you must have had like some thoughts about it before you come and like, before you come and like reach out to these people. So how do you consolidate the different narratives and your own perspective? Okay, thank you. Yeah, I cannot always consolidate them. Of course, I can always compare and contrast them, <laughs> and then compare and contrast them with the researchers' findings. That's, so that's why for me, it's in a way of comparing and contrasting. Yeah. But I cannot consolidate each one of them. Of course, it's impossible. But what I can consolidate is, of course, the new order history is manipulation. That's really clear. So that's what I can consolidate. Whereas with these people, what I can, I can see is whether they have been in a way somehow by this manipulation, like when they meet me and then they suddenly identify themselves as being communist. Yeah, why? There's so many forms of identities, but being communist and non communist, even now, is still important. Some of them. So I cannot consolidate everything. Um, actually, when I was interviewing them at the beginning, I thought, okay, yes, I'm trying to find out about the so-called the truth. At least that's what I was thinking. But as I kept going, I realized this is, it's too complicated because sometimes they all say, oh, no, 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 don't talk about this. Oh, no, 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 write, write it like this. Write it this way, write it that way. Doesn't it the concept of intention? So what, what's that intent in the first place? Like, you know, when they change the narratives, is that they have like a hidden agenda? I mean, they have like this kind of stuff that you know. That's that's usually what what I'm, I ask them why. Because usually, there is reasons. Yeah, some of them said. So one one of the reasons is they're afraid if this is read by people in Indonesia. And this may harm their families and relatives in English. Because you know, this history is still not <laughs> mass murder is still not acknowledged in Indonesia. So that's what they're still worried of their relatives in Indonesia. If they reveal something like, for instance, I'm just gonna give you a, an example. There was this exile who was uh, actually planning um uh, a, a revolution in Indonesia. And he was actually, uh, at one point, this exile went to Indonesia and tried to recruit students in Indonesia. And as when he was in Indonesia, 
he could actually conclude that the only way is armed revolution. Armed revolution, because otherwise it was impossible. It was so powerful that they, they, they must have armed. But, man. And then, and then when he went to Indonesia, he realized that the Indonesian students he talked to were so brainwashed that they would not oppose Suharto at that time. He was just so upset at that time. And then he just said it was impossible. So he, he got back to Germany and, and he, he was still trying to think what happened. And then he's, and this kind of story was just for him, it was impossible. Yeah, because if he said that he was really worried of family, things like that. And another thing is just uh, something that they consider too embarrassing. <gasps> yeah. Um, which I'd rather not say. Or uh, that there were also like personal fights among them. You know, like this is also. <laughs> There were not many women amongst the political exiles. So sometimes the fight is the fight to get women, things like that. Things like something personal, because there were not many women at that time. Very few, very, very few. And when they couldn't reveal their identities to each other, and then they revealed their identities to themselves, and they wanted to kind of like go out with, and, and then that's the when the problem started. It's like that's something really um so from something very personal to something very political and then the other one is of course the views of marxism and communism it can be quite you know marxism and communism can be interpreted differently as well and they could have different opinions about marxism and communism as well yeah i was wondering if you've done much research into what narratives are circulated among students at the moment in Indonesia. Like you mentioned the year of truth movement, and I wonder if there's some that's something sort of similar at the moment where the students are interrogating the history that's being um that's being shown in different monuments and museums at the moment in Indonesia, like this anti-communist rhetoric. Is there an active um effort to challenge that in Indonesia? Yes. Yeah. Uh, have you uh, gone to Indonesia, Phoebe? When I was younger, you yeah. know, for a long time. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's good that you're still interested in Indonesia. Um, yes, there the, are the, a lot of efforts at that time, in, at this time in Indonesia. There have been quite a lot. But the problem is the government still doesn't care. Although Jokowi at the beginning promised that he would sort out them human rights um, um, violations in the past, but it actually hasn't done much. So is the government still um, perpetuating this anti-communist oh, narrative? Yeah. Like they're, they're still- Well, Jokowi was, um, in a way, he's quite ambivalent in this case. So, during the um, International People's Tribunal, actually, I know uh, he let some people go. Yeah, he didn't actually ban them. He didn't condemn them. He didn't. He didn't say anything. He actually um, let them go. Yeah, and even one of my friends, an activist who came to the tribunal as one of the witnesses. She actually got a letter from Jokowi saying that, yeah, you can go. So a letter agreeing that she could actually leave. But when other people in the army condemned this uh, international people's tribunal, they also didn't do anything. So it, was, it was really like, um, he tried to stand on two feet, you know what I mean, in this case. And and he also said, "Oh, um, what well, I will best the PKI." At one point, he said like that. If there, if there was any PKI, I will best them. So he tried to stand on two feet in this case, and then he also, ah, oh, that film, the um, propaganda film made during the New Order. I think you know that, right? So there's this propaganda film called the um, what is it called? 
What's wrong with my head? The tragedy of the um, PKI movement, something like that. Actually, my head is a bit heavy today. Um, so it was bad before. And then during Jokowi, it was loud again. And it's not shown on TV yet. Kianatan G30 SPKI, yeah. I, I think it, it, um, it, it is indeed extraordinary uh, how little we know about what happened in the time. As you say, we don't even know who organized the killings in the and uh, um, you know, what were the planned follow ups. Uh, was there any involvement of the big idea or not? We just don't know. And, uh, and it's very hard to think of any other um, equally huge and significant event about in history about which is about which so little is known in recent time. But um, one of the major uh, international research initiatives in Indonesia before uh, getting all the rest, as I'm sure you know, was the Cornell Modern Indonesia. Papers, yeah. yeah uh, which involved the gears, the famous anthropologist, involved uh, Ruth McVeigh, who was later on here, to so I was teaching, and, and lots of others. And they, I um, uh, understand that they did try to make some attempt to find out what had really happened in the coup, although, of course, as you emphasize, the, the government was very wedded to the official version um, and wasn't interested in anybody finding out what really happened. Now, do you know what what did Cornell find out? Did they get anywhere with trying to? Yeah, so so Benedict Anderson, um, ben Anderson. Ben Anderson. Uh, he got the um, uh, the notes from the doctors of the corpses of the gentle. So at that time, Sukharto um, was there when the, <coughs> the doctor uh, checked the corpses and, and the report said that they, um, they had been mutilation, you know, eyes gorge and uh, <coughs> their penis got chopped off, things like that. And um, Ben Anderson got the note from the, the doctor who was there they think that there's no chopping off, there's no mutilation. Uh, every, you know, like the the eyes, the penis were intact, and um, and these people were shot from behind, many of them. So that that was the paper. In, uh, in, regarding the involvement of the PKI in the um, coup, 1965 coup, uh, there wasn't. So there were. Uh, quite a lot of evidence that the PKI was not involved. Although uh, some people, some researchers did say that, that uh, there might be some, not the PKI itself, but some PKI member or some PKI um, leaders who might have been involved. We don't know, you know, just because some of them mentioned I did might have been involved. But there was no strong evidence, but definitely the PKI was not in. Definitely. Um, oh, there, are, there are questions here on um, because this is hybrid, so then yeah. Um oh yeah, thank you for here. your explanation. I'm going to turn around to this one because yeah, they're, they're, they're already quite well, a lot of questions here. <laughs> yeah. So as a researcher, how can you also have this courage to explore this topic? Uh, because I believe that you also have a, maybe relatives or family in Indonesia. And maybe you were... Uh, okay. Maybe, uh, how, how can you defend your yeah. position as okay. a researcher? Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Regarding courage, I'm not the only courage is one. You know, there, there's so many of them who've done the research. So I, I, I'm not going to call myself courageous. I'm not going to call myself brave, but if you ask me what, you know, how I've been interested in this a lot, 
my father was a victim as well because my father was um, in prison and tortured in 1965. He was, um, oh, it was quite complicated if I tell you the story now. Uh, it will be a long story, uh, but he was, he was basically, he was, he was in prison and tortured in 1965. But he was alive, so that's why I was born. <laughs> <laughs> Because he, because he was murdered, if he were, if he were murdered, I wouldn't have been here, would I? How, how, can, how can you position yourself in this? Because you also have like this personal experience, personal bias, because your father directly involved in this situation. And how can you like, you know, yeah, maybe consolidate or something, have a very objective view as a researcher, because it's like kind of traumatic experience as well, I believe. Well, as a researcher, you just have to try at your best to be objective by evidence, by trying to get evidence. So you, you base everything on evidence by comparing and contrasting and evidence, not just say whatever you want. And, um, you know, like the new order history is clearly manipulation because it's, it's the evidence is not there. Yeah. So that's it. It's clearly manipulation. But when I talk to these political exiles, when they say something, most of the time they they do not want to manipulate things what they want is actually um you know if they, they ask me to keep something a secret it's because they think of other people so this is for me it's not manipulation probably it's secrecy to protect themselves they have to do it yeah or sometimes it's interpretation you know one say one say this thing one say another thing it's a matter of interpretation but not manipulation most of them, are, usually they don't tell me manipulated history. And probably they boast a bit. Yes, sometimes they do. But it's quite normal, yeah, because people, you know, human beings sometimes boast. <laughs> you boast about yourself every now and then. It's normal. So that's, that's how I am. Can we turn to this with the questions here first? Yeah. So, okay. Prior to the PKI uh, 1965, America funded and trained Indonesian soldiers. Oh, this is just a comment. So America funded and trained Indonesian soldiers to expel the Dutch from Papua. Could there be previous agreement that after the Dutch were expelled from Papua and entered Indonesia, America had the right to control gold in Papua? Oh, okay. Um, I'm just gonna answer this quickly because this is not actually, this is not, um, so this, uh, the question from Ari Mulyono, this is not actually my um, field, but yes, there was a, an agreement at that time, uh, which of course benefited America a lot more. And the agreement lasted for 100 years, by the way. Yeah. That's why, you know why West Papua wanted to be independent. Because by being independent, they can actually annul the agreement. Before being independent, the agreement lasted for 100 years. So that's why. Yeah, that's why they, uh, yeah. So another question from Fiona Lasmana. Thank you so much for your important, uh, important work. I would love to hear more about whether the political exiles have come together to form a diaspora community overseas. Oh, definitely. They, they have formed um, um, groups. They have had their own journals. They, they have been politically active. It's incredible, actually. And the fact that they call themselves political exiles now it is for them in a way, it is for me, it's in a kind of community itself. Yeah. And another question, how do they negotiate their own diasporic identity or sense of national belonging, having been forced to live outside of Indonesia for decades? Okay, this is quite interesting. So their sense of belonging, it's quite different actually, because any of them still identify themselves as Indonesian when I ask them, you know, so how do you identify yourself? Indonesian, I'm Indonesian. Lots of them actually, many of them. Only one among these people, 
only one actually told me that my home is now Germany. It's Baru Nomadi because he's quite open about it. I wrote about him in the Jakarta Post why he said his home is almost Germany. He, he worked <coughs> for Max Planck, so it was quite prestigious. He got a quite prestigious job, research job in Germany. He, he was just very intelligent, this guy. He was a chemist as well as a linguist. He spoke uh, how many languages? Fluently, in Dutch, Indonesian, English, German. I can't remember now how many languages. Lots, basically like five or six languages fluently. fluently. I think about six. And then he also read like, he also read Mandarin and basically two other languages. He reads them, so really, really talented. And he tried hard to actually get Indonesian citizen because during Gustur, um, Gustur was the president. Anyone has no Gustur is? Or should I explain who Gustur is? Also, oh, Gustur was the president after so after Sukarno, Suharto, and then Suharto was toppled, and then there was an incumbent president, and then after that it was Gustur. But Gustur also got toppled because he was. He, he tried to reduce the power of the army very quickly because he, he was really progressive. Gustur at that time said to the Indonesian political exile, we will recover your citizenship and your passport. You will get them. Automatically, that's what he said. And he said, I'm going to admit that there was a mistake of the Indonesian government that they did atrocities, they did mass murder, and I'm going to apologize. Not to happen. It was toppled again. <laughs> so, quickly, actually, quite quickly, it was toppled. Yeah. So when he promised that, um, Waruno Mahdi traveled from Germany to the Netherlands to meet the representative of Gusdu because he said, I want to get my Indonesian passport back. I want to be Indonesian again. And then Gusdu was toppled. That's it. This promise was. You know, was well, was not as well. Right? And only at that time he just said, "That's it, I'm fed up." He said, so he became um, a German citizen, and he said, "Because I'm, uh, I'm now a German citizen, and my home is German." That's what he said, because he said Germany has done a lot of good things to me. They had given me a home. They had given me a lot of things, and. Um, and Max Planck actually treated, treated him really well. He even still has an office. He's retired now, but he still, he still has an office in Max Planck. So he's, he's, really, he's treated really well. So he just said, my home is German, I'm German. So only one person said that. The others, they, they're different, yeah? And um, most of them are still so much attached to Indonesia. And even many of them said, oh, we want to be buried in Indonesia when we die. You know, so it's... it's very strong attachment. It's incredible in a way. It becomes a kind of an obsession because it was rejected, right? The Indonesians was rejected. So in the end for them, it becomes an obsession to be back to Indonesia, to become Indonesian again. So it's really sad when I heard about it. It was just really, I just can't believe it. You know, it's, they were rejected that much, at birth, but there's still this, this, this powerful, powerful uh, desire to go home. And that's all I think from the... <coughs> yeah, that, 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 that one. I can see anything else in the chat. No, that's all really from the Q&A. Any other question, please? Yes. Um, sorry, I have two questions, but okay. Thank you, Dr. Martin, for your amazing. Research. I was just call me Sutton. I used to be called. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was going to say you mentioned you chose Germany because of the, the interesting parallels between um, like the Holocaust for survivors yeah. and um, the field that you interested in. Did you, what was like the conclusion of that interest? Did you find any, any like interesting results? Um, not yet at the moment. Uh, I'm, I'm, I've not gone there yet. Yeah. So, because this is just the beginning. Yeah, it takes a long time because of that, you know, like I interviewed them and then they say, oh, no, 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 don't, don't do anything. And I was like, what the hell am I going to write now? <laughs> but it's not, 
I, I don't think it's the thing, thing. So I can I can learn from that as well. But no, I haven't I haven't gone through that. But um, actually, the, the the mass murder in Indonesia, the um, uh, the paramilitary adopted uh, Nazi strategies. Like even the, the, the name of the movement is Gestapo, is from Gestapo. And um, the paramilitary has the so-called Panzer troop, and it's from Panzer, you know what Panzer is? Panzer is the um, Nazi, yeah, Nazi Panzer, it's from there. So that's, that's how it's related. So they, they adopted the strategies, you know, by using the mass, people to actually attack um, the communists was similar in Germany. They, they actually used the, the people to attack the Jews. In the end, the Jews became the enemy of the people. Same as in Indonesia, the communists became the enemy of the people. So in the end, in the end, Indonesia at the time was divided either into communists or non or non-communists. So either you are communist or, or you are non-communist. And if you are communist, then to die. The bloody approach that Germany took in healing its community after the Second World War has had an effect also on the political exiles in Indonesia in Germany. Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Because this Maruno Mahdi, when he, he talked about Germany, that's what he said. He said, No, I'm German. Because when I see Germany, I'm actually impressed by what they've done. Because they, um, you know, in the past, they committed uh general like Holocaust mass murder it was an atrocity they admitted it they apologized they compensated the victims they did so a lot yeah there was that like um uh, uh, they punish the people responsible even now they still do it they even imprisoned a 90 year old grandmother who uh <laughs> acknowledge that Holocaust took place. So they're still chasing these people even now. So yeah, that that has a big impact on them. Uh, what, what, yes. What's the question again? Well, I was saying that um, uh, I wasn't aware of any suggestion that the massacres in Indonesia in 65 were ethnically driven. Now, of course, there was the element of the, the Chinese yeah. who were really leaked into it, but no one saying that all, all the all the big members were ethnic Chinese. Um, it was um, there were <laughs> okay. It was in a way in some places it was related to ethnic Chinese as well because at that time um, the PKI was close to China. The PKI. Yeah. <laughs> that period was close to China. And uh, um, so the, the ethnic Chinese was considered to be, especially the, the so-called Toto, Toto was considered as the, the most ethnic, you know, like they, 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 spill, they still maintain the Chinese identity and their Chinese language, you know. So these people was the, considered the real Chinese in Indonesia and the Toto. -to. And these Chinese were also targeted at that time because they were considered as linked or related to communists or close to communist people. So yeah, and, and, and as I said, not only communists were the victims, but also alleged communists. So for instance, um, usually what happened was the, um, the head of a village, for instance, or the head of a region, they they got the mandate to point, you know, uh, you know they, these people are communists, this, 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 yeah. So they, they could actually point who the communists were in the area. And sometimes if this man fell in love with someone's wife, he just said that man was communist, yeah. killed him. So he could get them. A huge amount of them, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, oh, old, old scores being said. Yeah. Like yeah. Or something like, you know, someone owed money to someone, and then because this person got um, 
mandate to point who the picket was. He says, oh, that's that's copied, <coughs> kill him. And that's it. His death is was annulled, you know? <laughs> it's easy. Something like that. It's something that it's personal or it's because of death, because of fighting for women, or because, because other, yeah, because so many other things. Then you, you could become communist and you could be murdered. You know, in Germany, it was so, this is the difference. In Germany, during the Holocaust, it was uh, one system. Yeah. They had uh, family trees in Germany. They actually wrote down, you know, oh, each family has to have family tree. So if any in the family tree as Jewish, then you, you will get caught. In Indonesia, it was so healthy. <laughs> was not a systematic at all. They just killed whoever they felt like sometimes. So that's the difference. In general, it was really systematic. But it's just, you know, um, even the way they, they execute, executed the people, you know, gas chamber was quite systematic, isn't it? In Indonesia, You could get killed like anywhere outside, and then your head was on the river. One day, and it was more brutal, you know. You know, it was more brutal. And at some point, even um, some people didn't want to eat fish because there were so many dead bodies in the river that the fish actually ate with these dead bodies. And there were there were some uh, news. And it was actually true that someone chopped the fist and found someone's finger inside the stomach of the fist. So people didn't want to eat fish for, for years at that time. <coughs> the, the river, uh, fish from the river, so they only ate the salt uh, from salt water on. So, yeah. any, any other question? Check whether there are other questions here. Oh, sound is not clear. I'm oh, sorry. I didn't read that. The sound is not clear. Hopefully the sound is clear now. Anything, any, any other question? Yeah? Um, I just, my background's in psychology, and so I'm really interested in like the, the accounts of like diplomatic memories. And a lot of like psychological research is around feelings of guilt and shame. And so to avoid feelings of shame around like the atrocities and like the trauma that kind of occurs in the individual, people choose feelings of guilt instead. And so they choose feelings of like, oh, I could have prevented what happened, or I could have done something better to like amend the situation, or I could have, you know, like saved myself and my family. Um, and so then often like memories are put in a time skewed order in that they think that they somehow could have predicted what would have happened and it could have been avoided. And so their memories are sort of scrambled to make a chronological sense of their guilt. And so I'm wondering if you saw any instances of this or like how do people negotiate around their guilt and their shame? How did that kind of come out of their accounts? Not yet, actually. But yeah, but that 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 is actually true because uh rather you know many of them still feel guilty, especially towards their families at home, you know, because they said, Oh, um, you know, I feel guilty because I can't go home, because I can't support them, I'm supposed to go home. Things like that. Yeah. But no, I haven't gone into that yet. But that's a very interesting point. Yeah. And and it, it is true, actually, that the, the sequence of the stories sometimes changes. <laughs> yeah. So one point they say this, and then another one they say that. And then it's not because they try to manipulate things, but because when you tell a story, you try to put things in sequence. And sometimes when something traumatic happened, everything got scanned. Yeah, and, and, and you don't know which one is which, which one happens first and which, you know, and sometimes they just say, when did it happen? 
They can't remember clearly. Something what came out of the um, was the Human Rights Commission of the Hague. Oh, it's International People's Tribunal. So International People's, I'm going to explain a bit about inter, International People's Tribunal. So International People's Tribunal is um, it's a court case, basically. It's a tribunal, court case. But usually court case was, uh, is held by the, uh, the, in relation to human rights and criminals like that, it's usually, held by the country, the state. But if the state refuses to do it, like in this case, Indonesia, the people then did it. So we did it. And by, by what I mean by we was, um, um, there the, the were coordinators at that time and the political exiles were involved. And yeah, so all of us did it together. And at that time, I was the, the, the British coordinator of that tribunal. So that's why I, I attended the tribunal. And uh, yeah. And during that, was there any acknowledgement by Britain or the US from any complicity? Yes. yes. There was an acknowledgement. And, and, and Obama actually said that there was, yeah, there, there was an acknowledgement. The British government didn't say anything much. Uh, no, not the British government, the, the American government, actually, Obama said something during the Obama. Is even the coup itself, that there was, you know, some planning behind that, or? The no, they just, government. they just admitted they, they haven't gone that far, but not the British government, I, I was wrong. The British government has not admitted it, because I just said it on the Guardian shoot months ago, that the British government should admit and apologize. The American government has not apologized, but they admitted it. Did they were involved. Yeah, yeah, not nothing specific. Was was too great, but but the British government has not admitted it. And they actually, you know, the American at that time they trained the soldiers as well how to torture these communists and they send names of people <coughs> of communists to be murdered. So they fax the names to be murdered and they send money to the Indonesian military and weapons to fight against the communists. So it's quite a lot. And then what happened was, I don't know whether you know what happened in Chile. Do you know what happened in Chile? No, okay. So in Chile, there was another left-wing government, demo democratically elected, um, Alinde, called Alinde, you yeah. know, and of course Alinde didn't really want to work together with the U.S. government as well because he tried to, you know, to make the country more kind of like independent of these Western companies, similar to Indonesia. And then because the strategy in Indonesia was so successful, it was exported to uh, Chile, and there you should Google it. It's called Operation Jakarta in Chile. It's called Google it, Chile Operation Jakarta. So Jakarta is quite famous in Chile <laughs> because of that. Uh, I'm sorry then. I'm sorry then. Uh, I will be. Uh, actually, I have done some experience with the with some where, where when your perspective you've done with the victims have done some experience with some perpetrators in my undergraduate teachers yeah. and yeah, yeah. Uh, where 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 was that can i ask uh i'm sorry i could not say that because <laughs> we know we know that some certain issues but just 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 to get just to get some just to get some few ideas i mean the first time i've done my undergraduate teacher writing about this the first and the most most greatest opposition comes actually from my parents. They just say, please don't. <laughs> they just say, please, please don't do this and something like that. But uh, to be honest, the one that I'm about to, maybe the one point that I have to disagree with you, is actually the uh, narrative that 
the Indonesian systematic killing actually happened because one of my questions was like, why such sudden craze of blood in 1965? What leads to it? What kind of condition that leads to it? And then I'm stuck in a rabbit hole after that. Because understanding I like the perpetrators asking about them, do you felt regret or do you think it is something to be regretful or something? And then they said, no, it's something, I mean, in the process of killing something, something like that. They said that it was necessary. It was indeed necessary. And they they it's not just the system that it's not that just it's not just which means the system does make them do the killings and stuff like the systematic killings, especially. I'm into the plantation scene, scheme when especially uh, they made the heart of the rural area where the killings actually took place, not in Jakarta, like Jakarta was really safe, like in fact that while the rural area suffered the damage. It's not just the religious factors and stuff like that that was taken in place, but the fact that PKI itself was common as a something to something that made the, the something that made prior to from the 60s to the 64 that made it more like uh, that, that made a more black like sheep in every in every in every way i mean like planner from not just life reformations i mean back in my back in, in my back in my class in the, plan, in the plantations they said that the guy used to usually do strikes and stuff like that that usually not just simple strikes are different strikes that leads to a high a really a really a really high amount of social social jealousy that grows within 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 the within the society environment itself so i guess the uh, so hard to uh, not just manipulate the history but the way that he manipulates the situations the current situation in indonesia back in 65 i think it's not just as simple as people carrying everywhere, but they have reasons to do it, not just because personal reasons. Of course, there are plenty of cases of personal reasons like families and then uh, marital stuff and stuff like that. And in my place, uh, they, they, they use the army to do the systematic killings and stuff like that, but there are, uh, especially the methods of killing are very <laughs> regional centers rather than uh, very sporadic rather than centralized but i think i have to add that uh on the reasons why uh why the killing happens not just based on the political reasons and stuff like that it's just like even the word when they use pki i mean for a few of my a few of my interviewee uh, tell that pki was part of AI indonesia right okay so the <laughs> statements of the interviewee of the that pki does manage and uh, they took all the blame because they wanted. It's 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 like in their goal to do something. And so I think that's a few. Sorry, sorry, they took the blame. Uh, I mean the PKI, they just took the blame because they have programs that that they have programs that make the they have programs that indeed they want to educate the civil servant and stuff like that. But they didn't. The level of education and the level of grassroots organization of the communist organization itself then went to the rural area was was very very base and even when it comes they did not uh, the the villagers the villagers the rural area people did not understand what they is but they are there and somehow the villagers the villagers discovered that by using the guy it gives some kind of power and this just makes things worse and started to get extreme or whatever okay let me answer your questions now five what I mean by systematic was the way they, um, you know, selected who to murder. It was chaotic. It was really chaotic. Clearly, you know, who was pick, pick it out? Not, not no. Whereas in in Germany, it was clearly more systematic. Yeah, family tree. You know, there was a system of finding out who the Jews was. That's what I meant. Yeah. But the other one, of course, there, there, there were other systems, of course, that you mentioned, which, so we were talking about two different things. And regarding the, the PKI at that time, uh, uh, grassroots, I disagree with you because the PKI actually went to the grassroots more than, more than any organization now, I think. You know, they talk to farmers, they talk to uh, laborers a lot. And have you seen the film um, 
the look of silence. So yeah, you know, it was <coughs> there were small farmers. And the PKM went there with small farmers in a very secluded area. Yeah. Uh, now it's not that much, but at that time it was quite secluded. The PKI went there. They, were, they educated the people and the, um, the left-wing women, Garwani actually, they opened up a um, school to educate women who can, could not, illiterate women and the children. So definitely they went to the grassroots. And of course, not all grassroots knew what PKI was, it was quite clear. You know, they could not educate everyone. Uh, the PK, definitely, definitely, they went to, you know, went to classroom. That was quite clear. Yeah. And at that time, the, the farmers and laborers were very political because, um, because the PKI educated them to be like that. You know, I mean, they were really, really political. Because I know, you know, Adi Rukun, the, the, the protagonist of the of the film, The Look of Silence. I know him quite well, and he told me actually, yeah, that, that time the farmers knew about politics. They, they knew what communism was, they knew what Marxism was. And now you talk to the farmers, they don't want to know about politics. You know, they don't care. They want to grow rice, they want to grow cows, and they want to have cows, keep cows, and then they want to sell them, and they, they don't care. They don't really care. So any question? Any other question? Yeah. Okay, that's um, just for, um, because right now I think um, the discourse of uh, communism, or I, uh, the discourse of communism in Indonesia is quite taboo. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was just talking to my um, relatives recently that they were saying that, you know, uh, sometimes there are things that you can't talk about in Indonesia, like such as like, um, things about communism and something that we have to like, uh, personal perspective about whether it's good or bad, just because so my question would be then, um, well, this is, it's good that you kind of like bring up this issue, this discourse, um, and get the accounts of the different perspectives out from different countries, yeah, different countries of New York. But um, so at the end of the day, what do you hope to achieve out of this discourse for the discourse to be united in Indonesia, or it to be more fluid, or do you hope that there's some truth that comes out of all of this um, relationship that you find by? What I want is uh, again, it's not the truth, yeah, because it's it's in a way it's um not possible. What I want is the, these different discourses to come up, so people have um a kind of options, not just one discourse, but more critical to different discourses, which is it's not the truth, but at least they should be able to differentiate. You know um, that there's a manipulated one. It's clearly, it's manipulation, and these discourses, which may not be the truth, but it opens up another another perspective, yeah, or other perspectives. It opens up other perspective. So that's that's what I want. Basically, but there's a question here. Um, how do you define, uh, how do you build the opposition of truth and non-truth? In this case, I cannot really define that like in, in the clearly opposite, you know, completely opposite. But that's why I just rely on some theories, uh, like postmodernist theories that say, though, there's no truth. And the other one that says, oh, there's, uh, so this, these two opposites, which I, I, I take from postmodernists, which is the opposite side that they said there's no truth, and um, the one that you swear in court because the, the activists usually um, they when they say about the truth, they usually uh, aim the truth to bring it to justice, and that's why this is how I, I take it. It's from the court the saying in the court. The truth and nothing but the truth. yeah. So so I, I try to make the oppositions on this. Any other question? I ask. Uh, but how can you raise those issues or study this issue when in Indonesia we still have the law that we cannot talk about it, like tough embarrassed? 
number 35. We still have that and it's still, it's still, yeah, it's, it's simple for me. When you have to choose between law and humanity, choose human. Yeah, whether you, you have to follow the law or humanity, which one you have to choose? Humanity, who stop? Break the law, you know, if necessary, any time, break the law. Yeah, but you can say that because your, your research is here, hmm. but how can we, if, if I go back to Indonesia, raise, want to raise this issue? Oh, no. that's, that's my advice, break the law. <laughs> break the law and choose human so that's it yeah so that's what you know like Edward Snowden and you know all of the whistleblower you know how they actually break the law to leak out some information it's really important information so I'm really for them you know break the law anytime if you have to choose between law and human break the law there should be no question of that there should be no doubt about this. You must break the law anytime. If you have to choose between the law, uh, the law and you. Hi, thank you for letting your I just wanted to ask uh, where did you find for the whole exiles who are in hiding, who, who didn't want their names to be published in your it's from a friend and a friend. Oh, it's, it's really, it's a long story. But I, I know, I know some people would ask me this. Um, it's a long story because um, I've been going back and forth to Germany a lot. Fortunately, my husband's, uh, my husband's research is also in Germany. So that's why when he goes to Germany, then I'll come with him and then I could get free accommodation sometimes. You know? <laughs> but otherwise I have to spend a lot of money, you know. Because it's expensive, right? This kind of research, and um, and you know, uh, at so as the research money is getting <laughs> all that stuff. <laughs> so fortunately, I have to spend only you know, like um, usually only airfare. Usually, most of the time, just I just pay for the airfare. So that's in a way, I'm unlikely in that case. And um, so I knew. The first political exile I knew was Ari Parsana. It's from a friend. Because I was invited to give a talk in Germany. And when I gave a talk in Germany, at that time I was talking about the 1965. And that's why these political exiles, in a way, trusted me. So, in a way, I was lucky that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, it was because I gave a talk and then I met these political exiles. And then from these political exiles, then I knew other political exiles. That's how. We can always talk on the phone, which is cheaper, but it's different. When you are there, staying with them, what they tell you, it's, it can be completely different. They can open up a lot more. Yeah, so that's why I like to travel to Germany and meet them in person. They can be like, you know, just, just more open in the end with me. But yeah, it's expensive. <laughs> but sometimes I want to, you know, like when I travel in Berlin to meet this Supercho and Varuno, I thought to make it, okay, Berlin, meet two of them and then that's it, right? So I save money. No, when I went to Berlin, I met Supercho Varuno and, you know, like his friend passed away. And then so he had to leave Berlin and then I couldn't meet him and I thought, Okay, then I'll have to come back. <laughs> so sometimes things like that happen. So I already stayed, I already, you know, traveled to Berlin, booked accommodation for a few nights to meet the two of them. No, I'll be with one. Okay, that's fine. Then I had to come back. Another question. Just for one more question that should be. No? Yeah, that's it then. Thank you so much. Have a good